Uh, hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for coming. If you're new here, uh, you're in the Frank Ratchi Studio for Creative Inquiry. I'm Golan Levin, the director of this space, where we are devoted to supporting atypical, antidisciplinary, and interinstitutional research and outreach at the intersection of art, science, technology, and culture. We're the research lab of the College of Fine Arts. We tonight have a very special guest. Um, uh, uh, it's Ranjit Bhatnagar. R Ranjit is a uh, sound artist and new media artist uh, extraordinaire who um, has been working in sound art for a long time, uh, but also makes uh, a really wide range of creative and whimsical and provocative projects that span the range from totally analog and simple to totally computational and complicated. Um, and so <coughs> uh, without further ado, it's my terrific pleasure to introduce Ranjit, who's here all the way from Brooklyn. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ranjit. This is my website, moonmilk.com, which is a terrible, terrible website because I forget to ever update it, except when I'm doing my, my yearly project, Instrument a Day, which is what kind of what brought me here to the studio. So let me just show you what we did here at the studio yesterday, this video. was yesterday afternoon. So yesterday, Golan took us all to the Center for Creative Reuse. How many of you have been to the... <laughs> Yay, everybody, pretty much. It's an amazing place. And he, he treated us. He said, buy anything you want. Just get all, this, all the goodies from the Center. And we brought it all back here. And we just hung out for a few hours and made whatever musical instruments we could improvise out of them. And this is come out of a project I've been on for a long time, the Instrument a Day project, which basically every year for the last 10 years, I've spent the month of February trying to make one musical instrument every single day of the month, which is an insane project. It's obviously impossible, and I kind of sort of get it done sometimes. So let me talk about some of the other stuff I work on, and then I'll get back to the Instrument a Day stuff. I'm a, mostly a sound artist. I work a lot with music, musical instruments. I'm really interested in ideas of performance and performance anxiety. I'm a super shy person myself. I'm not a musician, partly because it's really scary for me to get up on a stage and perform for people. But I've done installations and artwork related to that and about that, and then also just about music and sound in general. For a lot. For a lot of artists, for visual artists, perhaps vision is their primary sense. For me, sound is definitely the most primal sense. It's most of my memories have sound rather than vision attached to them and so forth. So let's see, this is a recent project I did for a sound art festival in New York State, the Garden of Sonic Delights, which was a really cool outdoor sound sculpture show sponsored by the, the state of New York with a lot of support from various foundations, which are probably listed here somewhere. Oh yeah, here they are. Various donors and stuff. I always feel like I'm supposed to thank all the donors, but then I can't remember who they are. Who they are so anyway, for this project, 
they asked me to come up with some outdoor sculpture for a the campus of uh, of Purchase College in outside of New York City. And I have a friend, a Canadian friend, who I've been wanting to work with for a long time because she's an expert dry stone waller. So for, she, for years, she's been learning to cut stone and build walls and sculpture with no, no mortar or cement. It's just piling stone to make, to make structures. So I wanted to work with her and make a, <coughs> make a, a sculpture that was all, all dry stone and would have sensors embedded in the stone so that the sensors would feed into a synthesizer, the synthesizer would play music 24 hours a day, and very slowly, as the earth erodes under the stone and the stones shift, the, it'll change the pressure on the sensors and it'll cause the, the tune it plays to change. So this is a little promo video they made of that piece called Stone Song. And it turned out I couldn't work with my friend Hillary because she was busy that time. So I had to actually work with a friend of hers who was also awesome, Akira, who is also a brilliant stone worker. And we worked collaboratively to come up with the shape and design of this piece. What you're hearing in the soundtrack is fairly representative of what it sounds like. It changes all the time because besides being sensitive to the weight of the stones, it also monitors the weather. It has humidity and air pressure and air temperature sensors, and it uses those to make short-term variations in the tune, but the longer-term changes are caused by the much slower process of erosion. Filmmakers really love their tracking shots. So there's three speakers hidden inside the stones. And because the stones are loosely fit together with no cement, no fasteners, there's enough gaps that the sound can just squeeze out through the gaps in the stones, which actually works really well because you can't exactly tell where the sound is coming from, but it oozes out from the, from the stones. But there's also enough protection that this thing has been up now for about two and a half years and the electronics is still okay, so it's working fine, I guess. We actually, we had to build this, this sculpture. This is definitely the heaviest thing I've ever made. It weighs four tons. We built it in upstate New York and then we had to take it apart and truck it to the campus of Purchase College and re rebuild it there. This was going to be a temporary one-year show, but then one of the sponsoring institutions, the Caramore Center for Music and the Arts, decided they wanted to keep it as a permanent installation. So then we took it apart again and trucked it about 30 miles over to Caramore's campus, where it now lives, hopefully permanently, because I never want to have to move it again. <laughs> This was a fun project working with, it's very much site specific, the, the use of the cut stone was kind of inspired by, this is all in Westchester County, New York, where everywhere you go out in the suburbs there you see all these stone walls. For centuries, the people who live there have been building stone walls that look very much like, like this stuff. Okay, that's enough of that. And for those of you who are curious about the technical stuff, this thing is run with a Teensy Arduino clone, which is just sitting in a metal box. The Teensy is monitoring the 18, no, 16 pressure sensors and the weather sensors, and it uses that to make a drone, which it then plays through three channels of audio through three speakers hidden inside the stone. Th somewhere around here. Oh yeah, here you can see it was solar powered mostly because they couldn't get power to this lawn. The lawn was completely ringed by street lights, but they said, sorry, no power. So at the last minute, we had to add solar power. In this box is the, the little tiny Arduino, which is about that big, which runs the four-ton sculpture. 
Another recent piece that I did, this is very much related to what I was saying about performance and shyness. This is called Singing Room for a Shy Person. This was a piece that was commissioned by the Metamatic Research Institute in Amsterdam, their uh, arts organization that was putting on a festival in memory of the Swiss artist Jean Tangeli. And this went on to be as part of a group show at the Jean Tangeli Museum in Basel, Switzerland. So this was a, a piece where I, I built a soundproof booth where a theoretical shy person could go in this booth and sing all they want and nobody can hear you on the outside. We actually went to a huge amount of effort and expense to make these really heavy duty walls. It's about the size of a telephone booth but the walls are like a foot thick, stuffed with insulation and heavy, heavy plasterboard so that you really can't be heard on the outside when the door shuts. In fact, when you close the door, your ears pop because it's such a tight seal. I'm really serious about not being able to hear. And when you're inside, you can sing. There's some little toys and games to play with in there to distract you. And on the outside, there's these robot musical instruments that take your voice and computationally reinterpret it in a kind of clunky mechanical way. And the idea is that way, if, you, if you're shy but you're interested in the idea of performing for the public, you can go in there, you can sing to the robots, the robots will sing to the public for you, and you're kind of insulated by that one layer or maybe it's like three or four layers of insulation. And hearing my voice testing the thing, you can tell why I don't want to sing for the public. I don't want to hear that. The singing room for a shy person is intended for somebody who would like to sing for the public, but they're too scared. So they can go and hide in the room there. They can sing and nobody can hear them. And they're still performing in a way because the instruments are interpreting their voice for them. Do, 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 ba, 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 The machine listens to the voice on the microphone, which will be in the singing booth there. And as it listens, it interprets the voice, splits it up into parts, and tries to reproduce it mechanically on the instruments here. Uh... This was really hard work to make. It took me about a year and a half altogether. All this is, all these things are pretty much handmade by me, except for the singing booth, the soundproof booth. We showed it in New York, and I hired some people in New York to help build that. And then when they, when they rebuilt it in Switzerland, they made a whole new singing booth there, which was, as you would expect from Swiss injury, and it was really incredible. <laughs> But yeah, I, I actually had to learn the basics of furniture making just so I could make these various stands for my instruments and not have them fall apart as soon as everything started moving. But it was a fun project, kind of crazy, and obviously couldn't have been done without support from some rich guy in Amsterdam. <laughs> what else? Let's see. So another thing I often do is is music, composition, and performance. But usually, again, 
I like to be somewhat insulated from the actual performance part by when I, when I can do it, I get robots to do the performing for me. This was a collaboration with the uh, artist and musician Hisham Barucha, who it's, it's really his concept. I was just helping out with it, but this was a great project where we put together a circle of 19 robot drums, and then we got various guest artists to program sequences and play along with the drums. And this was just a test sequence that I made, but there was this dog who was hanging out at the art space at the time. And she really, really loved the drums. I had broken the sequence where the, the rhythms of the drums would swirl around in circles, and the dog would run in circles chasing the rhythm. She also liked to try to bite the, the beaters on the drums, and she loved it when they struggled to get away from her. This was a project I did. I was commissioned for the Brooklyn Ballet. They wanted a experimental soundtrack for their dancers to improvise in front of. And this was another th thing where I just wanted to take an excuse to work with a friend. This was David Chang, who I'd been in a show with before. And David Chang is a calligrapher. And we thought it would be really neat to make a video where we, we record him doing his calligraphy live and turn it into music, turn, the, turn his movements and the scratching of his pen into music. So we used a bunch of different techniques for this. Used an accelerometer on the pen to measure the speed at which the pen was moving and turn that into sound. We also had microphones on the pen and on the paper to both take the direct acoustic sound and also to measure the amount of sound and use that to do various parameters. This was divided up into five, about four minute sections originally, so that they could have their five dancers each come out and do a four minute improv in front of it. And then this was a really fun project I did a few years ago. I got a gift from a friend, which was a little toy chihuahua, and this little toy chihuahua always barks 26 times in a row. And so I thought, okay, I, I'm going to get all my friends who are composers to compose 26 note long pieces and have the Chihuahua perform these 26 note long compositions. So I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I'll play some samples of it. And this was, this was done for a, an automatic music festival in New York. There's a cool group called Qubit, Q-U-B-I-T, in New York that often puts together concerts and installations of experimental music and sound art. And for this, they managed to get a hold of four disc laviers, four Yamaha robot pianos. And they stuffed all four of those things in a room and then threw a bunch of artists and musicians in there and said, hey, do something with these. So I hooked up my chihuahua to the pianos and had them play my friend's compositions. <laughs> Again, for those of you who are media artists and curious about the guts of this thing, the Chihuahua is singing into a microphone which is hooked up to a computer running processing. And in processing, it's just watching for the onset of each yap note. And it's using that as a trigger to send the next MIDI note out to the robot pianos. <laughs> I don't know if you know the piece Vexations by 
Eric Satie. It's a famously weird, very short piece of music that he said in a weird cryptic note on the manuscript that you should play it 860 times in a row or something like that, which is not happening here. But I also noticed that Vexations has exactly 52 beats, which is exactly twice 26. So I just took Vexations, chopped it in half, and had the Chihuahua yap out the first half, and then it yaps out the second half about 100 times faster than it's supposed to be played. <laughs> I still have that chihuahua, of course. And then another thing I do, this is actually often, most often it's in connection with this Instrument Day project that I do every February. I try to get together with friends at the end of the month, like in early March, and we, we gather up whichever of the instruments were actually any good, which is usually a minority of them. But I'll get together with friends and we'll we'll play around with the instruments and we'll come up with a performance and do a performance with the instruments that we invented during the month. And my friends in this band, the Glass Bees, did a few collaborations with me like that. So I'm not going to play any examples right now, but you can check out glassbees.com. They make awesome music. And the music without me is even more awesome than the music with me. So another thing I've done a lot of in the last few years is large group collaborative installations, which has been really fun because when you're working with a group of five or 10 or 15 other artists, you can make much bigger things than you could possibly make yourself. The first, one, first thing I ever did like that was the Fluxbox, which was hosted by an arts collaborative in Queens, New York called Flux Factory. And what they wanted to do was fill the entire gallery, which was a space almost as big as this, including as high. They wanted to make a giant walk-through sound sculpture, an automated music box that would play music while you walk through it. And I was one of about 10 sound artists and another five builders and assistants who put together this thing that ended up being two stories high, almost as big as this room. And it was just crazy. This was also 11 years ago, so you'll notice the video quality is way worse than the more recent recordings because I had a crappier digital camera then. The idea was you would walk in to the, a dark room. You would have to wind up the box to make it play. And the lights wouldn't come on until you wind it up. So this walkthrough sculpture was filled with all these different robot musical instruments and experiences that would play as you walk past them. It's all controlled by one master score. And that in turn is controlled by the crank that you wind it up with. notice that the lights just went out and it stopped playing. After you wind it up, it only plays for a minute or two before it stops, so you have to run back to the front and wind it up again. Oh, and by the way, what you see here, 
this is a pickle attached to 120 volts. So in theory, as you wind it up, it zaps the pickle and makes the pickle glow. This only worked for a few hours at the opening before the pickle dried out and didn't glow anymore. But even so, during the entire run of the show, whenever the thing stopped playing and we, you wanted people to wind it up again, you'd shout, crank the pickle, run upstairs. Ah, it ran, it ran out again, wind it up again. And trying to get to the part where you slide down the slide. All right, run up, run across the top. Okay. Slide down the slide. Run back to the beginning. Okay, anyway, that was the flux box that we built in Queens in 11 years ago. Wow. And that was up for about three or four months, and then we had to tear it down and throw it away, which is pretty sad. But that's what always happens, unfortunately. Unless you're lucky, and for something like, like this guy, it got adopted by an institution, and at least for now, we don't have to throw it away. Where was I? Oh, yeah, here. And then a few years later, with a lot of the same people, plus a lot of new artists, we did a similar sound sculpture project at the Palais de, Palais de Tokyo Museum in Paris. I'll show a bit of this video if, if Vimeo allows. This piece actually had a musical score by the Brooklyn artist and musician Nick Yulman, who was also on Fluxbox, and the French musician Julien Gasque. And the soundtrack was played on these robot instruments and also on recorded, recorded voices and recorded instruments. This is Nick's walkthrough video of the thing. This is a really cool invention of Nick's. He uses a little vibrating solenoid here to vibrate a book. So the book acts as a speaker. He can play different notes by vibrating the, the book at different speeds. But then if you turn the pages of the book, it changes the resonant qualities of the book. So the pitch, the, not the pitch, but the timbre of the instrument changes as you flip through the pages of the book. <laughs> So that was another of those really big collaborative projects. And in fact, we're getting together again, again with a lot of the same people. And we're doing something. We don't even know exactly what it's going to be yet, but we're do going to Aarhus in Denmark later this year, I think in May and June, to build something which will be big and crazy and noisy. And I guess we'll find out what it is. Also, I've never been to Denmark. So if any of you know anything about Denmark and want to tell me what it's like, please do. <laughs> Let's see. Oh yeah, yeah, this was actually another another big collaborative project that I've been working on for the last few years. This is the Music Box Village in New Orleans. There is a wonderful organization in New Orleans called New Orleans Airlift, and they're founded by a New Orleans musician and a New York artist who got together not long after not long after the big floods there to try to strategize ways to use art to help heal the city. And one of their many projects was the Music Box Village, where they've invited both local and outside artists to build these sound sculpture shanty towns, building little houses, sometimes temporary, sometimes permanent, that incorporate sound sculptures or musical instruments into their, into their structure. 
So I've worked on a few of these projects. They've done some in New Orleans, and they've also had these music box outposts, they call them, in other cities around the South. So just last year, we did one in Tampa Bay, Florida, and we were able to take some of the houses fr that we built in Tampa Bay and move them to New Orleans for their permanent home. They actually just recently were able to buy an amazing former industrial space in New Orleans itself, where they now have a permanent home for their these various sound sculpture houses they've built. Here's some cool pictures of the project and a quick video. So this is now a project that's involved probably like 50 artists and hundreds of musicians. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. I'm working on this project with New Orleans Airlift. We're working to create a building which functions as a house, but which also functions as musical architecture. We're all looking at it as this opportunity to make all the stuff that we think about all the time that's in our heads. The music box is really like a proof of concept. What does it mean, musical architecture? What could it be? I'm not going to show the whole video here, but if you don't take home anything else from this lecture, you should definitely go check out musicboxvillage.com and check out this work. They're always looking for new collaborators because this is a constantly evolving and growing Music Box Village. So if you're at all interested in sound sculpture, music, improvisation, that kind of thing, and you want to possibly get involved in a cool project in New Orleans or in other cities, get in touch with them. So what else? Okay, that was the Music Box Orchestra, Music Box Sandy Town. Oh yeah, this was my reminder to mention Denmark. <laughs> another, pro another thing I've been getting involved with a lot lately, probably in the last four years or so, is Twitter bot projects. Twitter is this, is there anyone here who is not at all familiar with, with Twitter? <laughs> I didn't think so. Yeah, Twitter is this crazy social network where all the loud screaming voices in the world are screaming loudly at once. And there are so many weird and wonderful ways that people have been using it. I, I should have prepared some examples of other people's Twitter bot work, but I didn't, so I'm not going to bother. I'm going to skip over that and tell you about some of my Twitter projects. One of them, which is definitely sound related in a kind of obscure way, is my earworm report Twitter blog, Twitter log, which is basically any time I have a song stuck in my head, I'll post it to this Twitter. <laughs> So if you ever want to know what songs are stuck in my head, you can go back to 2010 and see what song was stuck in my head every day since September 2010, more or less. And it's got kind of, there's kind of a ritual to it. It's got rules and regulations that are entirely self-imposed. Like, I'm not even going to go into it. The rules are so stupid, but there are rules for when I, should po when I have to post a song, when I can't post a song, and so forth. Which, that's half the fun to make up these silly rules for myself and then try to stick to them. 
Oh, there's also, in case you were really a glutton for punishment, there's a Spotify playlist containing all 5,413 songs that have been stuck in my head since September 2010, including all the repeats. There's a lot of repeats because some songs obviously come up more than once. You can go to this Spotify playlist and hear all 5,000 of them, which I don't recommend. But then another Twitter project that I'm really proud of is Pentametron. Let me blow that up a bit. So Pentametron was, it was just this silly idea I had a few years ago. Would it be possible to detect when people on Twitter are speaking accidentally in a particular rhythm, in particular the rhythm that Shakespeare used in his sonnets and a lot of his plays, pentameter, iambic pentameter. And it turns out that, yeah, that's really easy. You can tell if an English language text is an iambic pentameter with just a few dozen lines of code. And then with a few dozen more lines of code, you can tell if two pieces of iambic pentameter rhyme with each other. And then you can spend five years collecting them and posting them on Twitter, and you get, uh, f f uh, let's see, f a five, 59,455-line-long sonnet. So each of these lines, in theory, rhymes with the one next to it and is in iambic pentameter. I only care about the walking dead, not even 9 o'clock and I'm in bed. Ricardo Margarita called today, the rich forever way, the only way. Dreams are the seedlings of reality. Don't you remember nearly killing me? So, gloaming war so global warming is a force, a farce, a lie. I'm never going to sleep again. Goodbye. What college everybody going to? Nine, any movie that inspired you? Was going for the Cowboys anyway. Look at the Falcons showing out today. One of the fun things about Pentamedron is that when there's a big event that everybody on Twitter is talking about, because Pentamedron works only from what it sees on Twitter in real time, it's also going to talk about the Super Bowl for, for two couplets anyway. <laughs> so this has been going on now since 2012. It, it's collected besides the about 60,000 rhyming tweets that it's found and posted publicly. It also has accumulated a database of about one and a half million lines of pentameter that it couldn't find rhymes for. So I've been using that database for various things like, let's see if I can, oh yeah, I made a, a novel, which is 500 sonnets all sourced from Twitter. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Pick on at random. I wonder where the travel roster is. I'm such a scrubby little girl today. I wonder what the big announcement is. She said, okay, 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 okay. So Pentametron has been going on now for, for f five ish years. It's, it's got some fans. It has 23.4 thousand followers, which is way more than my personal account has, of course. And it also has fan art. So, for example, people have written songs based on Pentametron lyrics, like this one. Another body on the interstate. Good morning, bustle that accumulate. I want to be a tuna for sure, man. How many fashion weeks in Pakistan? I'm gonna buy a monkey soon I promise when you met her on that moon I'm always crying and doing the tattoo Really, really, really worried over you By the city bus without a knife Appreciate the little things in life Have everyone in just a holiday I didn't win another gift away I just wanted another friend But there can't be something to be said Another day, another day So you get the idea. And in fact, not just not just this person, but at least five. <laughs> oh yeah, I stopped at just the wrong time, didn't I? <laughs> at least five, five other musicians have spontaneously recorded pentametron songs, which is kind of amazing. But then there's another even more amazing piece of fan art so Pentam Pentametron lives in the same kind of weird abstract space as a bunch of other Twitter bots, including this one called Stupid Counter, which does nothing but it counts. Every minute it posts a new number, one higher than the number it posted before. And it turns out that, of course, some numbers, when written out in English, happen to be in iambic pentameter. And so how many of you have heard of Slash Fiction? 
Slash fiction is when fans of a certain piece of art will write basically sexy love stories about the characters in their favorite fiction. Somebody went and wrote slash fiction about Pentametron and Stupid Counter, <laughs> which you can find on Archive of Our Own, which is a famous fan fiction site. And this is actual, actual. it's not, not explicit, but it's, it's sexy love fiction between two Twitter bots. And I'm not going to read it, but you can find it quite easily by searching for Love Doesn't Have Restrictions by Ember Nickel. And actually, just a, a totally silly side note on that, I, I recently wrote an essay about Pentametron for a, for a German publication about digital humanities and computer-generated poetry and text and stuff like that. And I quoted, I mentioned this and put in a footnote and they translated the whole thing to German, so I, I now have the book with a copy of my essay entirely in German, but there's a footnote that mentions Love Doesn't Have Restrictions by Nickel, comma, Ember. I just love that they, they put the last name Nickel first, even though it's obviously a pseudonym. <laughs> so that's Pentametron, that's one of the projects that I'm really proud of, and again, to get a little bit into the technical side for those of you who are tech artists or just nerds like me. Pentametron is basically about 200 lines of PHP that's running on a virtual server somewhere in the cloud, probably in Los Angeles, I think. And it, it just subscribes to a live Twitter feed, which it used to receive about 500 to 1,000 tweets every second, but they recently downgraded me to like 50 to 100 tweets per second, so everything slowed down a bunch. It, it just receives these hundreds of tweets, millions of tweets a day, and it just examines every single one. It looks in a dictionary to see if it knows all the words. And if, it does, if there's a single word in the tweet it doesn't know, it just throws it away and goes to the next one because there's always more tweets out there. And then if, when, whenever it finds a tweet where it knows all the words, it compares the pronunciation and the, the rhythm of the tweet to see if it looks like it's an iambic pentameter. And if it is, it just stores it in a little buffer. It saves it up till it finds another one that rhymes. And when it finds one, it prints out a couplet. And then it erases its memory and starts fresh. And based on five years of that happening, you get this. All right, so let's see, what else? Oh yeah, I mentioned the, the novel. I, want, I do want to mention this cool project that inspired the novel, which is uh, or can I find it? Oh, here we go. So Darius Kasavi, who's this incredible tech artist and Twitter bot artist, just came up with this, what he thought at the time was a totally silly random idea in November of 2013. Maybe some of you know about NaNoWriMo, the National Novel Writing Month, which is basically a, an inspirational thing. The idea is to inspire, inspire people who've always wanted to write a novel to just go ahead, write your damn novel, just write as fast as you can during the month of November. Try to finish one novel. It doesn't have to be good or bad, it just has to be done in November of any year. So hundreds of thousands of people participate in NaNoWriMo every year and it's, it's an exercise that gets the creative juices flowing and a lot of people find it a really useful exercise even if the novel that they create isn't something they would ever want to publish. Maybe it helps them get their thoughts together for a real novel that they might make at a more reasonable pace. So anyway, Darius comes up with this idea, hey, let's, instead of nano, NaNoWriMo, let's do NaNoGenmo. You just write some code that generates the novel for you. It's way easier to have a bot write your novel than to, than to do it yourself. So, of course, I saw this and I thought, oh, ha, ha, that's a great idea. And then about one hour before the end of the month of November, I thought, wait a minute, I have Pentametron. Pentametron can generate a novel. And so in about 45 minutes between thinking I could do this and it being too late to meet the November deadline, I had Pentametron spew out this, this about 54,000 word novel entirely in perfect rhyming sonnets. But if you're interested in that kind of generative text thing, you should definitely check out NanoGenmo. There's hashtags, there's GitHub repositories and stuff, and there are hundreds and hundreds of really beautiful and amazing generated text that people have made each year since 2013 for NanoGenmo. 
most of them are much more profound and beautiful than I got an alligator for a pet. Okay, and I'll show one more quick novel that I made recently for, for NanoGenmo last year, which was I just searched for questions and answers on Twitter, not necessarily matching ten questions and answers, just questions and answers, and found ones that rhymed with each other and made this huge guidebook to any conceivable life situation. You can have a question and then find an answer that rhymes with it. Why does Will think he's slick? Because of you, I'm sick. Why do nerds feel the need to project their voices? Because I need to make healthier food choices. And they're organized vaguely by subject. There's a chapter about health, there's a chapter about relationships and so forth, which I just did with some simple keyword matching. Why is my dad such a tool? Because drips are fucking cool. Why did I take my brother to the pool? Because someone is clearly not a fool. And again, it's not a beautiful novel, but it's kind of a fun project, and it does go on long enough to be technically a novel. And then one thing people often ask me is, do you really support yourself working full time on weird musical instruments and crazy, crazy Twitter projects? And the answer is, no, of course not. I have to sell my soul to pay the rent in New York. So I just wanted to show one of the commercial projects I work on. For the last three or four years, the the main kind of commercial work I've done, which helps pay the rent and support the fun art stuff, is basically creative technology for marketing and commercial applications. And the last one I worked with with some friends was doing interactives for the Hall of Magic, which was an interactive experience of magic, fantasy, and illusion in support of marketing the TV show The Magicians on the Sci-Fi Channel, which maybe some of you are fans of. I'd never seen it but I read the books. So let me show you just a little bit of this. This is the library room. Oh. And who did we find? Hello. Oh, hello. hello. This is the, well, the Hall of Magic is dope. Yeah. You have the hall. That hall's your room. The hall is my room. It smells like a spa, doesn't it? And it looks sort of like if you were at the Natural History Museum Whoa. that you might find like a, uh, a caveman. Oh, damn phone. You know, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. Got it? This is real magic right this now. Real magic. I want to turn on the magic is real. You guys are real. Here's the thing, Penny's not very good at magic. <laughs> oh. I guess Penny's not. This is bad old thing. Uh, okay. So anyway, yeah, this was... This was built by a huge crew of set builders and designers and scene painters and set dressers and we were just a tiny part of this crew. They built this amazing, fairly convincing mansion set in a big concrete box over the course of two weeks and we helped them by adding interactive stuff. Like for instance, this room with a bunch of targets around the room and you could gesture at a target and affect it. And of course, again, for the tech people out here, we had a connect camera hidden hidden under the mirror there and the connect camera was tracking your gestures and like if you if you gesture at the clock it triggers a little motor in the clock that makes the hands spin if you gesture at the light it turns the light on and off and things like that so that's a, it was a fun project it's a bit of a bit soul sucking to work for marketing agencies but marketing agencies pay so much better than museums and galleries and i'm sorry universities <laughs> that it's, it's actually a pretty nice way to support myself doing, continuing to do creative technology, but just not always on my own terms. So, okay, so I've used up almost all my, all my time and I haven't even talked yet so much about the Instrument Today project, which is what brought me here. I had talked about Instrument Today at IO last year and Golan said, hey, that's pretty neat. You want to come and do an Instrument Today at the studio? And I said, of course I do. So Instrument Today started about 10 years ago okay, let's say exactly 10 years ago, there, at the time there was a project started by I think a couple of NYU grad students that they called Thing A Day, and they had been doing it, that was their second year of Thing A Day. They basically put up a blog where they encouraged people, every day in February, you should just do one creative project every day, no matter how quick, how, how little time you have, how little inspiration, just do something every day and document it, post it on a blog as a way to keep your, your creative brain going and force yourself over mental blocks and things like that. So the thing a day itself, they've retired, they're not running their blog anymore, but that was what inspired me to start Instrument Today. And so, yeah, I've been posting on Twitter now 
every February 28 or sometimes 29 days a day in February, I've been posting them all on Flickr and other social media and stuff. And it's been quite a crazy learning experience because the whole idea of this is I want to get something done every single day. And I also want to try to challenge myself, though not always. I want to try to do something new every time, but not always. So part of it is also making rules for myself and then breaking the rules. Like, I always want to finish my instrument before midnight, finish it and post the post before midnight, but sometimes not. Sometimes I'll cheat and take two days to make an instrument. But the main thing is just force myself to keep moving, try things I never tried before. Quite often I just totally fail and whatever I made is worthless and sometimes it works out great. So yeah, this is a quick scroll through the very first year of Instrument a Day. I made a whistle out of a walnut, I made a whistle out of a turnip, I made a tiny little synthesizer, a whistle out of a Coke can, I made an electric guitar out of this rod and stick I found in the park, I made a whistle out of an egg, I, found, I stole some wood from a construction site and made gongs out of it, which actually sounded pretty neat. Another whistle, one of the reasons why there's so many whistles is, well, one, whistles are fairly easy and yet slightly challenging, so it's a nice little exercise, and two, the day before this project started, I took a whistle workshop from this great artist, Michelle Rosenberg. <laughs> and so I had just learned to make whistles, and I thought, okay, let's make whistles all the time, and it was fun. I made a little thumb piano, found a piece of somebody's, dining, somebody's coffee table in the garbage and made a gong out of it. I made a weird horn. I'm going to play this one because that, that thing sounded amazing. That was just a piece of, I think, lightning fixture pipe with a reed made out of a a reed made out of a drinking straw, and it sounds like this. So maybe not the most beautiful thing ever, but it's fun. And so I did that in 2008, and then because I'd done it once, I thought, okay, 2009, I'll do it again, so what the heck. I managed to get through February making all sorts of different instruments, and there's a huge variety in how ambitious they are, depending on how much energy, how much inspiration I have in a day. Like, one day I might have virtually no inspiration, and I'll just make, or no time, and I'll make a shaker full of, full of seeds, and that's it. But at least I can make a, a pun for the name. Or another day I might want to make something extra nerdy, and I'll put together like an Arduino and servo controllers, and make a little slide guitar thingy, which it's not going to play, it's OK. And so I've been doing this now. This is the 10th year. I figure that if I get through this year, I can finally retire and never do this again. But So just here's an example of sort of what comes of keeping on trying over and over again. And I really am learning stuff from this because I've I've learned new construction techniques. I've learned much more how to work with my hands. Because for a long time, I was employed basically as a game developer, and before that, a web developer. So, so much of my work has always been on the screen and the keyboard. And it's been great to have this project, along with my bigger sound art and sound sculpture projects. This is a way to force myself to actually learn how to use a saw and a laser cutter and a drill press and stuff like that. So this is my first year violin which I made out of basically some garbage I found. And it sounds like this. Which, that's me playing now. I have no idea how to play a violin anyway. But it's not horrible for a thing made out of garbage and played by someone who doesn't know how to play a violin. But then fast forward like five or six years to my most complicated violin, which is being played by a professional violinist, Patty Kilroy, who's amazing. So yeah, this is, it's not a good violin, but it's a real violin. It's playable by real professionals. And yes, I really did make it in a day, about six hours the first time I made one, and maybe four hours the second time I made the same thing. 
which that's kind of totally cheating to reuse the exact same instrument a second year in a row, but I, I make the rules. I can break the rules if I want to. <laughs> so anyway, there, there's no way... There's no way before the instrument data project I would have known how to do the the 2D physical design of this thing and put it together, how to cut it out of a, on a laser cutter and assemble it and have it actually be playable. But the other thing is also without the instrument data project, I would never have even considered the idea because it's such a stupid idea. Can you design and build and play an entire violin in a day? Of course you can't. And that turns out to be wrong. <laughs> Oh, let's play a little bit more because Patty sounds really good. didn't hold its tune very well, but it wasn't too bad. So, but of course, the vast majority of the instruments I make in this project, one every stupid day, are not as complicated or as successful as that. So most of them, most of them, they, they're very ephemeral. Some of them are ambitious and fail. Some of them are ambitious and kind of good. A lot of them are just not ambitious at all, like a box with some rubber bands on it. But it's a great project, and I highly recommend trying something like this if you have kind of obsessive, an obsessive brain like I do, where it's really hard to get moving on a project because you'll have 150 ideas for your next project, or you have a big project you want to do, and there's three different paths you can take, and all the paths look really good, and you have no idea which way to go. If you have time for something like this, this kind of thing can break the dams in your brain and help you keep going. Let me show one more of these projects. This is one of my favorites. This is a speech synthesizer for pianists. The idea is that it translates. Speak and play. Hold that here. Let this do it. Speak and play. So we're going to do hello. Hello, we love toy pianos. Yeah. Hello, we love toy pianos. And make the score. It takes a second to work. All right. Look at the score. All right, there it is. That's the score. Okay. All right. Twelve tone. It Could does. Have written by Schoenberg. Yeah. <laughs> so, one cool thing about that is that this is basically the exact same exact same technology as pentametron. They both happened about the same time. I learned about this this dictionary called the actually it's the Carnegie Mellon Dictionary of English Pronunciation. And I discovered that you can use that in a very simple way to turn English text into pronunciations and vice versa. And that immediately flashed into my brain and I made pentametron and speak and play in the same week. Then the other cool thing about this is that pianist, Margaret Langtan, she's an internationally famous pianist who studied with John Cage and 
has recorded many amazing albums of experimental and contemporary music, and she's also my neighbor and obsessed with dogs like I am, which is, but I probably would not have ever met her if not for this kind of craziness. Here's one more, one more project. This is inspired by cuckoo clocks. It has little bellows and little whistles just hanging inside a cuckoo clock. This was actually commissioned by Margaret Langtan for a, for a performance she did for her 70th birthday in Singapore. She commissioned an incredible composition by the composer Phyllis Chen, composer and pianist Phyllis Chen. And again, it was because of this crazy instrument a day thing that I get to work with these amazing people. And here's a trailer of Margaret playing the cuckoo organ. And when I made it, I thought the cuckoo organ was kind of a novelty. It's just a toy. So nobody could possibly play anything more intricate than doot, 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 doot. But then... So you should also look up Margaret Langtan's Cabinet of Curiosities if you're curious about this piece, which she's now performed in various cities around the world. She played in Singapore and I think in Perth, Australia, or somewhere in Australia. And she tried to play it here in the United States. I forget some university, but UPS lost her baggage, which contained most of her instruments. Luckily, it was, it was only one of the two crates, so this instrument was not lost but a lot of valuable things were, which was really sad. So she had to scramble to replace all her gongs and bells and stuff. And I rebuilt some of the other instruments I made for her. So coming soon, there will be another performance, maybe a New York premiere of Margaret Langtan's Cabinet of Curiosities. Watch out for it. And that's the end of my talk. So I'm just going to show this picture that my friend sent of my dog. She's taking care of him. And the dog's name is Peter. And that's my website. Thank you.